Hi, my name is Dennis Berlin. I'm not lawyer, but my daddy is. Yeah. If you've been hurt in a car accident, then call my daddy. No need to scream and yell like a little kid. Yeah, I know why. My daddy will fight for your rights. Yeah, fight for your rights. If you've been involved in a car accident, call my daddy return in Dennis Berlin. Hello, I'm attorney Dennis Berlin. If you've been injured in a car wreck, call me, 713-229-0770. Call my daddy, daughter, daddy. Hey, what's up, you guys? This is Dennis Sperling. I am back again, and I want to talk to you guys about another African general. Um, his name is Yusuf Ibn Tashfin. Now, here's the thing. He's the cousin of Abu Bukhari uh, Ibn Umar, and this is the gentleman that we spoke about, spoke about last night. I'm going to put a photograph up of him from last. This is, this is his cousin, Abu Bukhar Ibn Umar. Now, I want you to look at this. This man was a Berber, a Lamun Tuna Berber. Now, look at the complexion of this photo, right? Now, this is the same man that they have on the cover with uh, um, Mansa Musa. And I'm going to pull that up too because I want you guys to see exactly where that, the origin of that photo. Now, this is the cousin of the man that we're going to talk about today. Okay, I want you guys to take a look and uh, make sure you check in. If you guys can hear me, hit the number one button. Uh, we're again, and we are talking about lessons black men can learn. But before we do that, the first thing we have to do is establish who this man was. Okay, he was a Berber. He was one of the Moorish, and what they call Moors, one of the invaders. And if you can look very carefully right here, this is uh Mansa Musa, okay, one of the emperors of Mali, and the and the photo will show up, and they have him uh, on the um, it'll come up in a minute. They have him, uh Abu Bukhari Ibn Umar on the same page with Mansa Musa. Okay, these are two black men. Nobody dis disputes the fact that Mansa Musa is a a black African man, broad nose, thick lip, woolly hair. And this is the man that they have on here on the back of what seems to be a uh, camel. All right. This is Abin Bukhar, uh, Abu Bukhar Ibn Umar. Now, let's go on over here to Yusuf. Okay. Now, Yusuf is Abu Bukhar Ibn Umar's cousin. All right. Now, let's check it out. Now, it's important that we remember that because history, uh, or not history, but, the, but they'll try to paint this African, this black man whose cousin is black as tar, as this man right here. This is the photo that they produce. This They want him to be so bad. They want Yusuf Abin Tashfin to, so bad to be have these white Eurocentric features that they would just straight out forge this photo. This was an African man from the West, uh, from, from from, from from the Sahara. Again, they trying to tell you that this man is the cousin of this man right here. Okay? They want you to believe that this light skinned man right here. Let me get the let me get the photo. This damn near white looking man. I want to get it back up again. Okay. They want you to believe that this guy right here, or this guy, it's the other angle is the cousin of uh, of this guy. See that? This guy who's depicted on a, a map or a scroll uh, with Mansa Musa, who's black, and they're both black. So 
that in itself lets you know that there are some shenanigans afoot and you should just go ahead and disregard that. Now, in addition to that, I want you to check out some photos. These were painted by um, a, a, uh, in 1889. These are photos painted by a German um, artist. Okay, these are the photos. He actually traveled to Germany. Uh, I'm sorry, he actually traveled to Egypt and traveled all around those different places. And he took photos of what he saw in 1889. Okay, these are the people that he saw throughout the Middle East, North Africa. These are the remnants of the Moors. These are look at these black men. This is what he took photos of right down to the detail. And then he just, when he, when he got back, he painted. The 19th century relationship between Europe and Africa was the exact opposite of what it was only before. Now, what happened in the 19th century? 19th century is between 1801 and 1899. He, he, and and at, by that time, Europe had conquered Africa and colonized it and all that. So what they're saying is in the 19th century, the relationship between Europe and Africa was the exact opposite of what it was only centuries before. From Robert uh, Briefolk, we learn from the fifth to the 10th century, Europe lay sunk in a night of barbarism. Okay, from the fifth to, so for 500 years, all right, Europe lay sunk in a night of barbarism. In other words, it was hell trying to live there. More terrible and horrible than that of the primitive savage. This is how bad Europe was. What came from Africa, however, would change the face of Europe forever. We are told the stormy increase in Western Islam, a peak that almost conquered the whole Europe and that in peace, uh, in, in peace Renaissance laid the foundation for the largely Berber feet. Who were the Berbers? Most textbooks claim they were and are white people. All right. Now, check this out. Uh, Kibet, Kush, Zanji, in the medieval, in the medieval, uh, medieval Arab genealogy, however, we find that Berbers, we find that Berbers, Africa North, grouped along the same, uh, grouped along the same rider added. This was the nation of the blacks. In 710 AD, Tarif, a, a Berber general, uh, general leadership, 500 men, uh, the Tarif, a Berber general leadership, 500 men in Spain after the Arab invasion of the North of, of North Africa and, and the conversion of Berbers to Islam. So the Arabs came in and converted all these Africans to Islam. That's what they're saying. But these were black men. These were this was the nation. This these are nations of blacks. He said that in 710 AD. All right. In Spain, they landed in a port renamed Tarifa in honor of their leader. Later, a tax would be levied from this port called a rate. The following year, 711, Tariq, another Berber, another black man, general, led a second and more de de decisive invasion. His 12,000 soldiers made their base on what they called Jebel. All right, now this is another picture. This is what this, this European man came in, and I'm gonna get his name in a minute. Uh, Al Tanken, uh, meaning Rock of Tank, which, which later, a uh, few people today know that these names derive from those Africans. General Tank proceeded to conquer Spain then under King Roderick, the leader of Germanic Gothic people who ruled the country. Van der Moren, himself a modern European chronicler wrote, the reins of their horses were like fire, their faces black like pitch, their eyes sparkled like the burning candles. Their horses were fast like leopards and horsemen fiercer than a wolf in a sheep fold in night. The noble Goths were broken in an hour, faster than the tongue can tell. Oh, unfortunate Spain. So you got these Gothic, Germany Goth, right? So you got these white boys over here trying to hold down Spain. 
And here come all these black men up from Africa who, who consider themselves who they would call Berbers, but who were also Muslim. And they came, and this is what they this is what they wrote of their face was as black as their black, pitch black, pitch black meaning like midnight dark black. This is what they look like. These are the Berbers. So when you tell me that this man right here, okay, this this man right here, this very uh, let me pull the picture back up again. You're not going to convince me that this guy right here, okay, all right, this guy did not lead. Uh, uh, hold on, I mean, lead these guys into battle, okay? This guy over here. Let me show you one more time. All right, that guy right there. He did not lead. He is not African, okay? These guys, these 12,000 guys that look like uh, this cat right here, they are not going to follow that guy, period. And where did he even come from? How did he get to Africa? Okay, that's what I want to know. <laughs> First of all, do they even speak the same language? So you're telling me this guy here is going to lead these guys into a war against more guys they look like him, right? The gods, the Germans, not gonna happen. So fellas, let's just let the facts sort through the lies for us, but uh, we'll finish reading this shortly. So here's moving forward. And if you appreciate this kind of conversation, cause I gotta establish this foundation first so you guys can have ammunition and everything is in references. See, anytime you have a black man who's a conqueror, and they always want to make him, they want to change his color, lighten him up, make him white. But you can't have a man who's in Africa surrounded by other dark black, black men and, and say he's the leader of all. It's not going to happen. This is not, you are not following somebody uh, uh, who is not a member of your tribe in Tibet. And these were all Berbers. These, these, were, these were what they called the Moors. The Moorish conquest, however, was overshadowed by the arrival of the Arab ruler from Africa. Musa ibn Musar, making Tariq bow to him. Musa placed his foot on his back, humbling act, and set the tone for the Arab uh, Berber relations for 50 years, and led to many Berber settlers fleeing Spain. From 715 to uh, 1031, the Syrian controlled the Umayyad dynasty ruled Spain. Almost, Although the Arabs came to power over time, the present vast numbers of Berbers increased African influence aided by the proximity of the continent. So they already had racial tension going on up in there. The Arabs being these light-skinned people that come through North Africa and they, it, it, it basically forced Islam onto these North Africans. I get that, but they still had this whole supremacy superiority because the Arabs were trading Africans. You know, they would, they, the, the Arab slave trade predated the European slave trade by 1400 years. So they've been doing that. So they still looked at them sideways like they were less than. So keep that in mind. OK, fellas. Um, as Berber took power in, in the army uh, and government, disagreement arose between the Arabs and the Africans. Meanwhile, in the 11th, see, they already knew there was a different people. Uh, meanwhile, in the 11th century, Africa, Africa, you hear leader of the Lam Lamtuma Berbers disposed deposed in front of the kingdom of Tukur in Senegal. Although they, they, there he found other Muslims and together they started a movement known as the al Moravids, becoming masters of the Western Sahara. They attacked the empire of Ghana in 1076 and conquered Morocco in 1882. So these was black men said, okay, we gonna come together and we gonna call this the al Moravids, and we as black men are gonna conquer Western Sahara uh, and I, and and they they attacked Ghana. I think they actually got hold of uh, um, Spain too. In Spain, in Spain, in Spain, the ancient Moors uh, were on the verge of losing everything when, in 1086, the Almoravids swept in. Although some of the Moors fought with the Spaniards against the Almoravids, the conquerors ruled from both. Uh, Marik, 
which is an important name we're going to remember related to Yusuf Ibn Tashfin when we get to him, in Morocco, in Seville, in Spain. The Almorvids, they are thought to have introduced the trend of minting gold coins in Europe. So basically what it's saying is you had some Moors fight on the side of the Spain, the Spanish, but for the most part, they was like, we all black. Why are we fighting each other? We come from the same place. You call yourself a Moor. I call myself, a, a, this is, we're part of the Almoravid, the Almoravid movement. But the bottom line, we are all coming from the same place. In Spain, the ancient Moors were on the verge of losing. Okay, I read that part. Um, but you see what they did. It was, it was these people. Right, the Almoravids who who brought in introduced the trend of minting gold coins in Europe. All right. So what happens after the victory? And this is this is what the brothers look like. Look at that black man right there. He is so he is black as that cloth right there. These are your brothers and sisters. They were they did not need, mind you, and there's so much to talk about. This is in 1068, 1076. Europe was well aware of what Africa was and 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 you know the empires and the gold. So when they say they kidnapped your people from from Africa and they brought you over here in chains and did you a favor, that's a damn lie. That's a lie from hell. And you need to recognize that they they are, they're lying to you, just like they're trying to lie and tell you that this these these group of black men, these black Berbers, these Moors, or these black Berbers, allowed this white man, Yusuf Ibn Titian, who wasn't white. To lead him. It wouldn't happen. He's not part of the tribe, period. Uh, Robin Walker, a writer in African history, describes the invaders as, as a mix of Senegalese and Berber people of different skin types. However, the Berbers came to be different, a different complexion when they started at black as pitch. Okay. That also explains why Arabs and Berbers had fallen apart in Spain and possibly why some Moors fought with the Spaniards, Spaniards against the new Africans of the block. All right. Uh, in other words, it was the old blood, right? It's, it's, it's color politics going on up in here, some colorism. The Arabs or conquerors were a different rank order than the black and the Berber mixed in North and West Africa. Being able to get more women, uh, being able to get more women, both Arab and Berber, Arab patriarchy meant that there many children were considered to be to, to, to consider to originate from their father's ethnic ethnic group, regardless of the mother. Uh, the Arab population grew faster than the Berber population. Over the centuries, the various tribes of North Africa became multicolored as some Berbers took Arab Spanish women. OK, in other words, these black men took Arab and Spanish women and their children were classified as Berbers and they too became multicolored. So basically what you have is black men, uh, you know, having children with women of different ethnicities. And over time, you, you brought about some colorism. So they were aware of colorism at the time. Although it is not usually a problem, there was an unmistakable color late in Arab society. All right, let's listen to that. Although it is not usually a problem, there was an unmistakable color late in Arab society. This man pictured was Moulay Ishmael Sharif, a direct ancestor of the current King Muhammad the Fourth. Uh, I'm sorry, Muhammad the uh, Sixth of Morocco. In 1672, Moulay had succeeded Ishmael as ruler after his brother Moulay Al Rashid had fallen from his horse and ran out of his uh, and, and ran out of his brain. At this time. He took the throne, 26-year-old Moulay. Ishmael became the government of the Minkis in northern country. So basically what we learned about here, fellas, is if you want to put it in modern-day context, these black men were SYSBM passport bros back in the day. They went over, they conquered different lands, they had children by different women. It was what it was. They went to Spain, they went to northern Africa. Um, they, they, this is what they were doing. So when people try to shame you, oh, stick, they were doing whatever they... All the men were having sex with everybody else's women, and the children would be the children of the father. You take on the, you take on the ethnicity or the tribe of your father, not your mother. This caused. Let's continue reading. Um, uh, so uh, let me see. Uh, all right, 
Tony Mule uh, became governor. It's, okay, somebody died, whatever. This caused the Berber to fight Arab and Berber fight among. This caused Berber to fight and Arab and Berber to fight among themselves. The longer the African state in Spain, the more likely this problem occurred. And this shows why they angrily grabbed new Africans in the fight. Uh, this is what your this is a portrait of an Arab horde. So this is a, this is an Arab, but this is clearly a black man, right? They call him the Arab, okay? Because what? Because you know, but he is clearly black. Let's let's look at him right now. Let's look at those features. That is a black African right there, even though he's called Arab. So let's not be fooled about who was over here fighting who. The 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 tight Islam of the early the tight Islam of the early Almoravids gave way to the religious laxity. In Morocco, however, a new strict mystical movement spread over the black Mas Masufa Berbers, led by Abin al Mahid Tuma. They seized Morocco in 1147 in Spain and uh, 1150. Now, see, it's not just about me reading. I want you guys to look at these photographs and look what's happening. This is a photograph of the charge, Adolf Schitzer, which prices. This. this is 8-20-28-18-29. Look at these black men out here fighting with these horses. We did not need what they were offering. Okay, we were fine where we were. We got along fine. We had all civilizations and whatnot. There was an action replay or even more battles between old and new Moors. To the Spanish, to the Spanish, the people of Al Mahid were named. Um, Al Mahidos, the Black Panther, uh, the Black Panther Morocco. Okay, the Prince Fami Gla Uyi, eighteen ninety three to nineteen fifty six. Pasha or Marakik, the Lord of the Atlas, is is head of the Berber clan. That has been a power in Morocco for more than a thousand years. This dynasty ruled from the River Senegal in Spain and has been described as the most beautiful flower of Muslim civilization. In Spain, they built a castle of Gibraltar, the great mosque of Seville and Giraldi of the Seville, the famous astronomical observatory. However, all of this tumbling came down. The old dis disunions crept in. Um, uh, the Moors lost from city to city with a number of battles at the part of the Christians, but with no fresh in invasions from new Africans to supplement them. All right, the, these are our brothers, look at this, okay? In 1248, they lost Sevilla, which ended Al uh, the Al Muhad in Spain, the Moors only place on, on to Granada in the south. In 1492, they lost this, so well an era in the word in the history ends. All right, now mind you, this is the same year that Spain got control 1492, what happened? The Spanish took all the stuff that the Moors had, they got the money, and they said, we're gonna build some ships, we're gonna find some new land. It's like that was the first thing they did. They said, go, we, let's get this, we're gonna find this land over here that we already know. Mind you, Mansa Musa, I'm sorry, Abu Bukhari II had already went over there 100 years before, so, uh, 200 years, but almost 200 years. They already knew it was over there. They knew, you see what I mean? So this, why is this the first thing you do once you get free? Think about that, fellas. Uh, Columbus already knew, he had talked to those uh, African uh, captains and whatnot, they knew what was up, they knew it was land over there. This is the first thing you do after you get rid of people that have been, had you uh, occupied for 800 years is hop in some boats and then sail across the ocean. That's the first thing you do, but either way. Now, again, this is an illustration of Mansa Musa depict holding a gold nugget in 1375. Uh, okay, mind you, we've seen this picture before, right? And this is Abu, Abu Bukhari ibn Umar. We talked about him already. And uh, these are two black men depicted on that photo. The old Ghana Empire in West Africa was 700 to one, from 700 to 1,000 in the 10th century. The Arab geographer Ibn Hawal mentioned the city of Adawagos, located in the Sahara northwest of Kim Salah in the 11th century. Al Bukhari al Cordoba, a Spanish Arab geographer, 
compile, compile his book of roads and kingdoms, a kind of travel guide for Africa. And in it, he described the same city as a large city with various markets, many date palms, henna trees, large olive trees, full of beautiful houses and solid buildings. Do you read that, brothers? Do you read that? This is what we had in Africa. This was North Africa. It was full of beautiful houses and solid buildings. We didn't need what white folks were offering us, brothers. We didn't need that. This is a, this is a, the old Ghana empire here. You see, this is what we had that. We didn't need what they were offering. Uh, Kumbu cell, the northern part of the empire, the mind you, we're looking at, uh, uh, this is going to be like the tip of Africa right here, right? The northern part of the empire was lost to the Muslim Berbers, who called themselves Almoravids, Moors, and had originally founded the Ghanaian Empire. Initially, the Ghanaian government recovered from this. Look at your brother. These are your brothers. This is what your brothers look like. This is look. This looks like you. Y'all got a cousin that looks just like him. Um, Alagos, also known as Adwagos. Uh, was important, an important oasis town at the southern end of the Trans-Sahara Caravan route that is mentioned in a number of early Arab manuscripts. The archaeologists' ex excavations at Teodos and Meritunia are thought to be the remains of the medieval, medieval audio dust. Um, Zenaga, uh, the Sanhaya tribe, Berber's tri tribe in southern Morocco, Mauritania and Sen Senegal, which gave their name to the modern Senegal, their original homeland. They form one of, one of the sub-Saharan tribes of Berbers who unite under the leadership of Yusuf Ben Tashfin, who we're going to talk about. Did you hear that? They form one of the sub-Saharan tribes of Berbers who unite under the leadership of Yusuf Ben Tashfin. Now, sub-Saharan means Negro. Sub-Saharan means broad nose, thick lip, kinky, nappy, woolly hair, whatever you want to call it. That does not look like, okay, this man they are trying to sell you as uh, Yusuf Abin Tashin. He does not look like he's a Sub-Saharan African. I don't care how many times they tell you Yusuf Bin was a famous soldier who fought against the he, this man right here, this man right here does not look like what they are describing, okay? They, let's read that again. The Berber tribe in Southern Morocco, Mauritania, and Senegal, which gave their name to the modern Senegal, their original homeland, okay? So these people are saying, we are originally from Mer Mauritania and Senegal, which are countries in Africa now, but it's really just, you know, basically the West Coast, where our people were stolen. This is their original homeland. They form one of the sub-Saharan tribes of Berbers who unite under the leadership of Yusuf bin Tashmi. Do you believe, where did this white man come from? If, if he is supposedly uh, uh, the leader of this sub-Saharan tribe of Berbers, where did this white man come from? How did he get there? Where, where did he come from? Where did this white man come from that they say, well, yeah, that, yeah, we cool with him. I mean, he, you know, so the, you just have to recognize it for what it is. It's, it's, it's a lie. It's, 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 you know, people ego tripping and, you know, spreading falsehoods because they don't want to give black men any credit. Uh, they crossed the Sahara and gave the dynasty, they crossed the Sahara and gave a dynasty in Morocco and Spain, uh, namely that of the Amorvids and the Zarid dynasty that supposed the Fatimites in the Maghreb in the city of Algiers was also of Zagina origin. The Zagina origin of uh, the Zagina Berber dialect is Southern Morocco. And, and Morocco is in Africa, by the way, folks. Morocco and on the banks of the lowest Senegal, especially by the Negro population. All right. Now we can go into this a little bit more, but they talk about the king of the Ashantis and uh, African Moorish Senegal, but that's not the whole point. The point is, I want you guys, Ludwig Douche, okay? This man is from 1855 to 1935. Now I'm going to describe the picture. We have not got to use of Ben Tashin yet, but I want to lay the background first so you'll know what you're looking at. Ludwig Douche, Deutsch, 
Deutsch means German. 1855 to 1935 was an Austrian painter who settled in Paris and became noted for his Orientalist art. In other words, he paints stuff from back over there or anywhere, you know, consider the East, only, you know, Eastern world, Oriental, Egypt, you know, that sort of stuff. Details of Ludwig Deutsch's life are obscure. He was born in Vienna in 1855 to a well-established Jewish family. His father, Ignaz Deutsch, was a financier in the Austrian court. He studied at the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. So this was a professional artist. Ludwig was a professional artist. He took his, his thing seriously, okay? Then in 1878, moved to Paris where he became strongly associated with Orientalism. All right, what does that mean? In art, history, literature, and culture study, Orientalism is the imitation or depiction of aspects of Eastern world. These depictions are usually done by writers, designers, artists from the West, in particular, Orientalist painting depicting more specifically the Middle East. So this is what he was into, okay? He's rich little dude, went to nice school, daddy, you know, hooked him up, whatever, he had money. But he didn't want to go into banking business. He wanted to paint pictures. Bless his heart. I get it. I understand. Sometimes you don't want to do what your daddy did. His banking and financing was probably born. I can understand. Now let's read a little bit more because it's important. He received his early art training at the Academy uh, der Berlin in Kunst Academy Fine Art under the tutelage of Anselm Furbar. Uh, in 1877, when Furbar retired as a teacher, Deutsch and some other students attempted to enter the class of Leopold Karl, who had moved to Paris in 1876, but initially were refused entry. In 1878, Deutsch was finally accepted at around the time. He may also have studied with Jean Paul Laurens. In Paris, Deutsch made, an, uh, made the acquaintance of artists Arthur von Ferris, uh, Jean Descartes, and Rudolf Ernest, who, who became his lifelong friend. Although this, these friendships, Deutsch developed an interest in Orientalist art. This is what's important for us. Okay, so this white man likes Oriental art and he's a professionally trained, well-trained artist. This is important. His first Orientalist painting was produced in 1881, some years before his first visit to Egypt. In around 1880, he broke his contacts with Vienna and settled in Paris. He established a studio room Le Petit in Paris and began to exhibit paintings with much success. Though his earliest Oriental subjects appeared in 1881, Deutsch first documented journeys to the Middle East where he made in 1885, 1890, and 1898 when he visited Egypt. Throughout the 1890s, he visited Egypt at least three times. Like many of his contemporaries, he found inspiration in the North African light colors, scenery, and customs. He collected a vast quantity of Oriental objects, including tiles, furniture, arm pipes, fabrics, and customs, which he would subsequently use in paintings. So he lay it down there and painted after he got back to his studio. His earlier work focused primarily on historical subjects. Right. He focused on historical subjects, in other words, people that really existed. But after visiting Egypt, he concentrated on Orientalist scenes. He was particularly interested in capturing rich, opulent scenes of palace and in, in, in variants. The detail in his paintings is excellent. He was prolific, producing many paintings with the same theme: prayers, guards. Listen to this prayers, guards, musicians, street vendors. In order to produce paintings in large volume, he created virtually assembly line approach using the same settings with different subjects and activities to create impression and variety. Many of Ludwig Deutsch's paintings are now in the Sharif Gaber collection. Among his best known works are The Scribe, painted six years after uh, Paul Janowitz did, uh, and, and did Beshi. Beshi's Bozoi, before a gateway, but in the same location, the musical interlude among Austrian artists. See, I want to get to this point. It's really, see, here's, here's where we at now. 
like many of his contemporaries, including uh, like many of his contemporaries, Deutsch made an extensive use of photography. This is what's important because see what you see below or what he painted when he got back to 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 his 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 place in Paris. He took photographs. He he. Deutsch made extensive use of photography to ensure archaeological accuracy in his paintings, renderings of local architecture features, i.e. tiles, uh, stonework, traditional mashra woodwork, and what has been described as a, as, as a documentary realism. This allowed him to use the Orient as inspiration, but to produce the most of his paintings in his Paris studio. So I, I say all that to say, uh, my brothers, that um, these are basically this man's photographs, okay? That he went back and painted. This is your brother. This is the picture of a guard. This is by Ludwig Deutsch, the man we just read about. Let's see if we can pull some other ones up. This is this is what your black brothers were doing in Africa. This is what your black brothers brothers were doing in northern uh, in, in 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 northern Africa. All right, this is only a hundred and some years ago. This is what your African brothers were doing. This is what they looked like. Okay, Egypt now looks different. This is what it looked like. Look at these black Africans here. You see that? Look at all that. All right, now, the more important thing is, and you got some, so you know, it's just not all black, it's all kind. But 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 this is important because this is what your brothers look like. We did not need what the Europeans were offering. Now, mind you, the Sahara, that was like a highway. People were going from the west to the east. And Europe, they would go there and do that all the time. I mean, who could, who could imagine? I mean, but that's what they did. So what I want the most important thing I want to depict for you brothers is I want to explain why I did this. Why I wanted to talk about this, the actual photo that you have, that's the pixel, um, that's the thumbnail, is a photo of uh, the emir, okay? The one that's on the thumbnail is and it's painted by Mr. Lud Ludwig um, Deutsch, that black man on there, and emir means prince. So that's who you're looking at, all right? That's a photo of him. He decided uh, this is a photo he took, and that was apparently a, a, a rendition of the Amir. Now, I want you guys to listen to this real quick, okay? This is our brother. Let me click out and click back in, and make sure you continue to keep contributing to, to the Cash App, the PayPal. You guys appreciate this. Make sure you contribute, but, but we're going to talk about why this is important for you. Uh, first thing you learn, that we were fine the way we were. That's the first thing. Second thing you learn, black men have been all over that continent and we're with all kinds of women having children. Let's continue to listen. The African invasion of Spain. The Africans, Berbers, and Arabs gave Spain. In case you guys don't know, this is a great teacher, Dr. John Heinrich Clark. He was one of the premier historians in the world, one of the best historians uh, uh, that has ever been uh, documented. Okay, this is Dr. John Henry Clark. Look him up. The greatest material civilization it ever had before or since. Yet, the Africans, Berbers, and Arabs so depressed Iberian or Spanish culture to the point it hasn't recovered to this very day. If you go to Spain right now, when they point to some achievement, it is some achievement the law left behind. They still hadn't recovered. I say every invader depresses the culture of a people 
and takes more away ultimately than they gave. I'm talking about the Europeans coming to the world doing the whole world more harm than good. And if he said he is the bringer of the You guys appreciate what I'm doing. Contribute to the Cash App and PayPal. And I'm going to um, I'm going to bring up a photograph that's the thumbnail here. Okay. And the reason that this is important. Oh man, can't believe that other one. That that, that this, this is the Emir. This is what Ludwig. Uh, uh, this is what 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 Ludwig Deutsch in his trips to Egypt and his trip to the Middle East. This is who did he decided would be an accurate photograph, or he took a photograph of this Emir, and he went back to the studio in Paris and painted it. Okay, this is a black. Clearly, this is a black man. Clearly, this is a black man. A Subset, as they call sub. This is a nose, thick lip, uh, uh, kinky haired, black, black. This is, this is they wrote them all. Okay. A lie. He is a liar and a hypocrite because he brought no light. He put out the light. And that he is in a position right now of losing the world, and each time he called an age, his golden age, is that age when he has somebody else to exploit outside of Europe. And that he never had a golden age when he had only Europe to feed on. He is being pushed right now to a point where he is being deprived of the land and the resources outside of Europe when he would rather blow up the world if he can't rule it. Now, what, our so, brothers, what our great and wise ancestor is telling us is that you're dealing with the people, the, the dominant society. These are people that would not be ruled. They would rather destroy the world than allow it to be ruled by others or, or sh share the resource. This is what Dr. John Henry Clark is saying in his great wisdom. So the people of the world had better protect themselves or prepare to go back in chain. Because he'd rather enslave it or destroy it if he can't rule it. Okay. So we're going to move on to the next brother. All right. Now, this is basically talk about our African brothers in Europe. Oh. <laughs> you cup your hands and <laughs> turn your head to one side. <laughs> They've been mixed with us so long. <laughs> It's just impossible to find a single Spanish on the face of the earth who don't have at least a few drops of us. <laughs> they used to boast about it, but now in this country, you know, when, if they can pass the taxi cab test, they try to pass <laughs> the color test. <laughs> don't argue the point, you know. If you can pass, it, pass. All right, good luck. Good, good luck, bro. <laughs> don't make no fuss about it. Okay. 
Okay, I think I've established the point, fellas. Um, so now, since we understand, okay, the context and the backdrop, let's talk about our brother, Yusuf Eben Tashman. Now, the photograph that um, Ludwig, uh, the photograph that Ludwig have of an Amir was of a black man. I do not believe that if your cousin was a black man, that you are going to come out looking like a, a white man, period. But so we have to understand that that is just racism at foot and trying to distort history to hide our history from us. So we're gonna go ahead and proceed now and talk about Yusuf Abin. And this is just to carry over from the conversation we've already had, because we've already talked about him, i.e. through his, his cousin, Abu. So here we go. Let's proceed. Sharing the screen. If I can, oh, it's in here. Okay, so this is in Wikipedia. Yusuf Abin Tashin, he ranked from 1061 to 1106. He was a leader of the Berber Amorvid Empire. He co-founded the city of Marrakesh. All right, remember Marrakesh was the place that uh, Abu Bukhar Ibn Umar decided to build because he didn't like living in that posh, that, that posh luxury uh, stuff that was going on. Look at this courtyard though. Look how beautiful it is. It's the fourth largest city in the kingdom of Morocco. It is the capital of the mid southwestern region of Marrakesh. Safi, it is west of the foothills of the Atlas Mountains. Marrakesh is 580 kilometers or 360 miles southwest of the Tangier uh, and 203 miles southwest of where well, you can look it up for yourself. But either way, and let, okay, he, he co founded the city of Marrakesh. He co founded with his, with his cousin, Abu uh, Bukhar ibn Umar, and led the Muslim forces to battle in the Sangarahas. Ibn Tashman came to Al Aldenus, Al Andalus from Africa to help the Muslim fight against Alfonso IV, eventually achieving victory and promoting Islamic religion in the region. He married Zainab Ananafa. We remember her. We remember Zainab, right? Remember the lady? She was smart. We thought she was a magician. Another black woman in Africa. Remember, she was more, she was a, a black woman. In that in that Moroccan area, who reportedly trusted, she people trusted politically. All right, Yusuf Ibn Tashfin was a Berber from the Ban the Banu Turgut, a branch of the Lamunta, a tribe belonging to the Sanjaha Sanjaha group. Okay, now who are these people? Um, this is who they are. All right, this is they are. Were once the largest Berber tribal confederations among the along. With the Zanata Masmuda Confederation, many tribes in Morocco, Western Sahara, Meritunia bore and still carry the, the ethnonym, especially its Berber from the other names and population. Okay. So let's keep on looking. Hold on a minute. Let's fall back. We, we, we lost it for a minute. All right. So Sanjaha. Let's look at this. Let's let's get this going. And if you guys appreciate this, make sure you contribute to the super chat, the cash app, and the PayPal. Shout out to everybody who's contributing. You guys don't forget about that. I'm working hard over here. But um, Yusuf Ibn Tashfin was a Berber from the Bantu. We talked about that. Uh, modern scholarship rejects Berber Yemeni link as fanciful. Abu Bukhar Ibn Umar, a natural leader. This is his cousin. Abu Bukhar Ibn Umar, a natural leader of the Lamtuma extraction branch of the Sanjaha and one of the original disciples of the Ibn Yasin who served as spiritual liaison of the followers of Malik and Maliki school of Islamic jurisprudence was appointed chief commander after the death of his brother Yaha Ibn Umar al Tuni. his brother oversaw the military for Ibn Yasin but was killed in battle at uh let's just click and see what they got him looking like hold on I, I, 
I'm sorry, fellas. I just want to see they ain't put a picture up. A lot of times they won't put the picture up if, if it's just undisputed, undisputed black. They ain't got to that one yet. You see what I'm saying? They can't just can't get around, it, you know, so they just like down. So they don't put it up. But this man is telling you, um, let's see. He was down there fighting in Ghana and got killed, fighting the Bloods in Ghana and got killed. So these are all black men fighting each other for tower, territory and fame, and money and whatnot and wealth. So Abu Bukhari's brother, which would also be uh, Yusuf Ibn Tashkin's uh, cousin, right, got killed uh, fighting in Ghana. So they made Abu, the, 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 you know, the champion. OK, they made him the, the leader. His brother oversaw the military for Ibn Yasin and was killed in battle at Tabafia against the Godala tribes in 1056. Ibn Yasin too would die in battle against the Bakwala three years later. Abu Bakar was an able general taking the fertile sus in the capital of Armak in a, a year after his brother's death and would go on to suppress numerous revolts in Sahara. We read about that. He divorced uh, uh, Zayab. And Zad, Zang, Zay, he divorced Zainab and then went to Sahara and, and fought. And then he came back. Remember what happened when he came back? He appears to have handed off his authority to, to the interim, but even went as far as to give use of his wife. Zainab, uh, now, you guys know Zainab. We talked about her last night. Purportedly, the richest woman in Ottawa. So he made good choices in women. This sort of trust and favor on part of the seasoned veteran and savvy politi politician reflected the general esteem in which Yusuf was held, not to mention the power he attained as military figure in his absence. Daunted by Yusuf's new profound power, Abu Bukhar sought any attempts to re to at recapturing his political um, unfeasible and, 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 and return to the fringes of the Sahara to settle unrest in, in southern frontier. So basically say, look, they met him out there. Yusuf met Yusuf and Zadnab. Yusuf met his cousin out there. Look, man, let's get this money. I'm going to give you some money and some gifts. And then he went off back to the, back to the Sahara where he liked to live. Uh, so that's basically how that we talked about that last night. So let's talk about his military exports. If we're talking about now that he's he's got the position, Yusuf has got the position secure. In, nine, in the year 19, uh, 1091, the last sovereign king of the Al Andalus saw his Abihad inherited and controlled since, 2000, since uh, 1069 in jeopardy of being taken under increasingly stronger Castile Leon Afonso IV. And the Tafia period followed the demise of the Umed Caliphate. Previously, the Emir had launched a series of aggressive attacks on neighboring kingdoms, so as to amass more territory for himself. But his military aspirations and capabilities pale in comparison to those of the Castilian king, who, who in name uh, of Christendom in 1085 captured Toledo and exacted Piraeus to, to or tribute from Muslim princes in places such as Granada, which is in and Seville, uh, being no exception. These are places in Morocco. The tribute of the emirs bolstered the economy of the Christian kingdom, harmed the Muslim economy. These are the circumstances that led the Almoravid conquest and the most famous quote rebuffing his son, Rashid, who advised him not to call on Yusuf ibn Tashin, where al well, where al el mutat to me said, I have no desire to be branded by my descendants as a man who delivered al Andalus as prey to the infidels. I am loath to have my name cursed in every Muslim pulpit. And for my part, I would rather be a camel driver in Africa than a swine herd in the Castile. <laughs> yeah, they were serious about that. So um, Yusuf was an effective general and a strategist who put together a formidable army comprising Sudanese contingents. So he got people from the Sudan. This is a black man leading other black men, Christian mercenaries and Saharan tribes of the Gulala, the Lamtuni, and the Musufa, which enabled him to expand the empire, crossing the Atlas Mountains onto the plains of Morocco, reaching the Mediterranean, capturing Fez. 
Then 1075, Tangier, 1079, uh, uh, Talisimian, and 1080, and uh, Setuna, and 1083 were Algiers. Um, Tanese, or he is, he is regarded as a co-founder of the famous Moroccan city, Marrakech in Berber, Marrakush, uh, corrupted in Morocco and Morocco in English. The site has been chosen and works started by Abu Bukhar in 1070. Remember, Abu Bukhar was in the process of building Marrakech, but then he had to go off to war in the Sahara, so he left it. His, his cousin Yusuf finished. That's how that happened. Remember that. The work was completed by Yusuf, who then made it a capital of the empire. So, so look at Yusuf. Yusuf is a finisher. He's an opportunist. He sees things. Okay, you give me why? Cool. I'm going to hold on to that. All right, bam. You want to finish? I'll finish. Look at, look at this man's insight. Not only was a general, but he was a leader, made smart decisions. This is your black brother right here. In place of the formal capital, Agmat, by the time Abu Bukhar died in 1087 after his skirmish in Sahara as a result of a poison arrow, Yusuf had crossed over into the Al into the Aldunas and achieved victory at the Battle of Azazila, also known as the Battle of Sagrias in the West. And uh, he he um, hold on one. Um, he came al he, he came he came to al al Andes with a force of fifteen thousand men and armed with javelins and daggers, most of the soldiers carrying two swords, shields, uh, like those pictures that we saw, carices and finest leather and animal hide, and accompanied by drummers uh, for psychological effect. Yusuf's cavalry was said to have included six thousand shock troops from Senegal mounted on White Arabian horses, camels were also put to use. On October 23rd, 1086, the Almoravid forces, accompanied by 10,000 Andalusian fighters from local Muslim provinces, decidedly checked the Reconquesta significantly, outnumbering and defending, defeating the largest Christian army ever assembled to the, that point. The death of Yusuf's heir, however, prompted his speedy return to Africa. When Yusuf returned to an Andalus in Al Andalus in 1090. He saw the lax behavior of the Tafia kings, both spiritually and militarily, as a breach of Islamic law and principles, and left Africa with the express purposes of usurping the power of all the Muslim principalities under the auspices of Abbasid Caliph of Baghdad, with whom he had shared correspondence under the slogan, "Mind you, this dude is all the way in Baghdad." They send in the cam. They're selling. They they are communicating. This is not you're not just stuck in your little territory. Okay, they're getting across there. That Serengeti is not an op. That's not an obstacle for them. Not that time. Under the slogan "Spreading Righteousness and Correction of Injustice and Abolition of Unlawful Taxes," the emirs, which means princes, and the prince. That's what it means. In in such cities as Seville, Bad Badajoz, Almeria, and Granada had grown accustomed to extravagant ways of the West, on top of doling out tribute to Christians and giving Andalusians and Andalusian Jews unprecedented freedoms and authority. They had levied burdensome taxes to the, to the populace to maintain the lifestyle. After a series of fatwas, uh, the careful deliberations, Yusuf saw an implementation of orthodoxy as long overdue. That year, he exiled the emirs Abdullah and his brother Timin from the from Granada and Malaga, and respectfully to Agmat. And a year later, Al Mutamid of Seville suffered the same fate. When all was said and done, Yusuf united the Muslim dominions of the Iberian Peninsula, with the exception of Zaragoza, to the Kingdom of Morocco, and situated his royal court in Marrakech. He took the title Amir al-Muslim, Prince of the Muslims, seeming, seeing himself as humbly, a humble, humbly serving the Caliph of Baghdad. But to all intents and purposes, he was considered the Caliph of the Western Islamic Empire. The military might of the al Morbids was at its peak. Okay, um, the, San, the San Hanja Confederation, which consisted of a hierarchy of Lamunta Musa. Uh, Musafa and Dujala Berbers represented the military's top brass. Amongst them were the Andalusian Christians and the heretic Africans. Take 
taking up duties as um, Dwan or Abu Yusuf's own personal bodyguard, including 2,000 black horsemen. Okay, do you think a white man is going to have 2,000 black horsemen protecting him? He was a black man. That's why they would live and die for him. He was one of them whose tasks include registering soldiers and making sure they were compensated financially. These are the people he trusted. Occupying forces of the Almobits were made up largely of horsemen totaling no less than 20,000 in the major cities of the Aldunius, Seville, 7,000, Granada. Okay, so basically what I'm telling you, this is, this is, look at this man's organizational skills. Look at what he did. He took something that originally he just fell in his lap and he made something out of it. Here's the description of him. A wise and shrewd man, neither too prompt in his determination nor too slow in carrying them in effect. Yusuf was very much adapted to the rugged terrain of the Sahara and had no interest in the pomp of the Andalusian courts. According to medieval Arabic writers, Yusuf was of average build structure. He deferred to describe as clear brown complexion. He was a brown complexion man. He had a thin beard. His voice was soft. His speech elegant. His eyes were black. His nose was hooked. He had he had he had fat on his fleshy portions of his ears. His hair was curly. His eyebrows met above his nose. All right. So this man, this is a black dude. All right. This is black. They saying he's brown. They saying he, you know, he had black eyes. This is who we dealing with up in here. But uh, either way, and you and you know what his cousin is like. That's that's the most important thing. You see what his cousin looked like. So uh, we've talked a little bit. You guys who want to come in and talk about what can we learn about our brother? He was a very intelligent man. You see, he managed to avoid war with his, his cousin. Uh, and he did what? You know, he, he, he took on the, the title of prince of, uh, of the Muslims as opposed to the, uh, you know, the religious leader. All right. Uh, join the conversation. Please. Let's talk about it. If you appreciate what we're doing, make sure you contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. Uh, hey, if you're enjoying the content here at Dennis Sperling Unfiltered, make sure you support it by like, sharing, and subscribing to the channel. And also, hit that little notification bell in the corner so that you'll get notice of each and every one of our live feeds. All right, now here's the thing, you guys. I know that some of you don't find this interesting. I know that some of you guys much prefer me talk about the Takashi 6 9 Maybe you want me to talk about the George Floyd um, murder trial. I don't know. But I think this is something that, that can feed you. I think this is something that you can walk away with. Just hearing about these stories, hearing about what these black men were doing in Africa uh, over a thousand years ago, uh, four, three, four hundred years ago before um Columbus and all the rest of them came and invaded and, and did what they did in Africa and kidnapped some of our relatives. Let's hear about what the rest of our relatives are doing. We see what we okay, we see what um we know what happened to our relatives who got kidnapped and brought to the Americas. But what about the rest of our relatives? Why can't we talk about them? See, this is where we are now. We're talking about Yusuf Abin Tashman. We're talking about his cousin, uh, Abu uh, Abin Umar. But the way you guys let me know you appreciate what I'm doing is you continue to contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. All right? This is midday. You know, this is what we're doing here. And so uh, I want you guys to show your appreciation by contributing to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. So that's how you let me know you like it. The other way you let me know is you hit the number one button. Let me know you're hearing. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up button. Anybody who wants to come in, let's talk about it. But some of the things that we can learn about our brother, um, Yusuf Ibn Tashman, is first of all, um, he was a very intelligent man. He's a very shrewd man. Okay. He was clearly a warrior. He took over where his cousin left off, picked up, and moved forward. It was an opportunity that wasn't only it had he, he was he was it was an opportunity. OK, you want to go off and fight a war? You're going to put me in charge. Cool. And then when the cousin tried to come back, he made it apparent to, um, you know, yeah, you my cousin, Uba, but I'm not really trying to get his power up here. Take these gifts. Let's be cool. 
and let's let's move around. You see what I mean? So this is this is what our black brother look. This is what our brother did. And so what you brothers have to realize is that um, this is your heritage. This is the masculinity that you can pull from. He doesn't come off like some jerk. He, he comes off as thoughtful and smart and intelligent. OK, um, this is this is who you can pattern yourself. We don't always have to pattern ourselves. They always try to throw, you know, Martin Luther King up on us. And we love Brother Dr. Martin Luther King. We appreciate him. I always trying to show Malcolm X, you know, but, you know, and we appreciate him. Great philosopher. But why can't we talk about these generals? You know, why can't we talk about these black men who conquered lands? Now, this is the picture of the emir that Ludwig uh, Deutsch decided to take a picture of and paint when he got back to Paris. All right. This is the picture that he. Now, you know, he's an emir. Because see the, the guard over here in the corner, he's bowing to him. Lemire is coming out the castle, probably just woke up, had him some coffee. You know what I mean? Got a little back rub from one of his little women. You understand? And he popped on up out. And then the dude see him. These are black men. These are our brothers. Let's let's zoom in on this photograph. This looks like somebody in our family. I know you got somebody to look just like this brother right here. OK, but you see in the background, the brothers bowing to him. This is what we look like, black men. Before this is what our ancestors, looks. this is what our brothers look like. This was a prince. This was an emir. This is a Muslim prince here. This is what you look like. OK, this is how you got down. That's what your your brother showed you that respect. Look at that. The two swords, as they describe. Be ready for war. You run up in here, you're going to get hurt. You're going to get that work. This is what you look like, black man. You see, this is where you draw your masculinity from. All right. This is your example of masculinity. He looked like you don't want no smoke. He looked like if you run up, you're going to get put down. That's what this looks like to me. He got that whole demeanor. That's the that's that's power right there. This is the photograph captured by this. Uh, uh, European artist Ludwig Deutsch, who then went back to Paris and created this photograph. Look at the opulence. Look at this. Look at the detail. This is our brother, the silken robes. I think you brothers need to see this. What's something like it? What are your thoughts here, man? How you doing today? I'm good, brother. How you doing? Peace to you and peace to your family. I appreciate it, man. So we're talking about Yusuf Ibn Tashman. I kind of went in explaining how this had to be a black man um, based on who his cousin, his word, who his relatives were, the location he was in. Um, and then this is the this is the actual photograph that I use as a thumbnail produced by Ludwig Deutsch, the gentleman, uh, the, the, the uh, Austrian author, Austrian artist, professionally trained artist who would travel to Egypt and take pictures. This is what he saw going on in Egypt. And this is, he took these photographs, but it's a documentary of this. This is our brother. But what are your thoughts on this, man? A picture's worth a thousand words, man. Mm -hmm. um, it shows the beauty and the opulence, but also, like you said, the power. Um, yeah. Everything um, within that picture from the guard, bowing to him from the guard at the ready. Can I tell you something? Go this ahead. is where Coming to America 2 should have picked up where um, <laughs> Prince Akeem should have looked like, his people should have looked like. There was no sign of masculinity or strength at all. You know, this is showing, but you know what, this is showing masculinity and strength, but not overdoing it, it's giving it enough. It's, you're knowing that this, what this is about. He's mm -hmm. in charge. You know that he's the prince. You know, he's strapped with a sword, a knife, and a flintlock pistol. Yeah. And he's just got a look on his face like, you know, this is my place. But he's in control. He's relaxed. And he's poised. He's showing that he is the king. And this is the land that he rules. But mm -hmm. also, you see everything, just the beauty within how the designs, how the way, you know, 
the more science and technology is and just how the way it was just beautiful back then. You know, just the beautiful marble floors, how those tilings were taken by Europeans and now is seen all around the world. We created that. And just seeing how we were in our regalness and our beauty. What do you think about how he handled his cousin when his cousin came back from war? Smart man. He wasn't 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 trying to start nothing, no be none. Mm -hmm. um, he knew the power and the strength of his cousin. He knew how to choose his battles, but he knew it was the smart thing to do. Yeah. Now, another fact is Yusuf went on to have two children with Zahi, that woman. She uh -huh. had two sons with him, or two children. And so he locked that relationship down. I mean, he definitely was opportunistic. I mean, because it fell in his lap, and he could have fumbled it, but he didn't. You know what I'm saying? But you know what he thought of? And also his wife, mm -hmm. despite whatever might have happened from the beginning, they still believed in legacy. Mm -hmm. Remember, we, you know, the key word through all this is purpose. Right. The key word is purpose. OK, things might not went away, but he said, OK, we're going to have children. We're going to still leave a legacy. And about what she's got to say or what. Her ex-husband had to say, no, we're going to still leave a legacy for our people to have. Ain't about that. He knew what he has to do. He's still leaving a legacy. He's still holding down a dynasty. He ain't trying to move with his wife back to her old country and him giving up his title as king because she don't feel right. And now he's lost in another land. He ain't doing no Prince Harry BS. No, this is a black man understanding his purpose. I mean, his now that you purpose. Now that you now this picture was painted in 18, uh, 1898. Mm -hmm. How do you by European artists? How do you feel now knowing that even back then when they were calling us saying Africa was, was a bunch of monkeys and stuff like that over there, trees. And they, they got art, they got artists going down there painting pictures like that. How does that make you feel knowing that they purposely lied to you like that? And now, like your artists are painting pictures of this level of opulence. And yet you're telling us over here that we're descended from monkeys and our people were swinging from trees, but yet and still they my our people are riding around with silk and stuff like that. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel it makes me feel a little bit pissed, but it also reflects on white folks' ignorance and insecurities. Mm -hmm. You know, their level of hate and their level of just insecurity because it reflects on you. It is it hate I mean, or is it jealousy? All the above, man. It is definitely a jealousy. And then there's a hate because when you really point it, when you point the finger, well, what are you doing? What were your people doing? Your people were running around in caves, man. You people they were running around in caves. They were in Europe in squalor. That's what I mean. They were in just squalor. Yeah. You you people had no sewage system. You were dying from the plague. You were living in barns with animals. You had no real medical care. You had no real care for your people. You had no real care to feed your people. No. But here, you know, the, this man was looking good. Shoot, black people were living well. We didn't need you. We were doing fine. We had to help you come out of your rut. Mm. Matter of fact, let's be honest. The Moors and the Africans were your stimulus package back in the day. <laughs> So and they know what? it. Yeah. Well, they know it. Many of them don't. But it's more important that we know it. Uh -huh. You know, now as, as a black man, especially as a dark skinned black man, how's it feel? How's it feel seeing a black prince like this? It warms my heart. It warms my heart and it's just and it makes you proud. It makes mm -hmm. you proud and and you know. You see the beauty and the majesty, not just in him, but in everything, even the guard, man. 
yeah. even the guard, his masculinity and his beauty and his majesty, but as he's bowing and the guard is at the ready, you know, just, 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 I mean, but just look how he looked, man. He looked fly. I mean, everything from his turban down to his silk slippers. <laughs> and somebody, I mean, a, a black man wearing silk slippers, ain't nothing gay about that man. No, not at all. I mean, but people looking at him, brother, see how the way he's standing there. Anything he's and everything like about it. Yeah. yeah. But you know what the whole, whole funny thing is? Yeah. His poise and, and his stance even got swag about him, man. <laughs> right. That's where we get that from, man. Yes, and then. Yeah. He, he didn't have to have no... um. Tommy Hilfiger, no Tom Ford, no Coco Chanel to tell him, oh, you got to wear this, wear that. Man, I'm wearing what I have. I know right. I look good because I'm a king. Well, there's some there's some other photos I want to share with you guys. I'll try and bring them up real quick. But overall, man, what, what do you think about this, this thing I'm doing here with these, um, these programs? This is another photo by Ludwig Deutsch, uh, another video, not a photo, another uh, painting by uh, Mr. Ludwig Deutsch, if I can get it to come up. It's all the me. You're borging out a little bit, brother. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, brother. I hear you now. Okay, let me see here. I'm trying to. Well, either way, so I, I'll uh, I'll try and pull it up a little bit later. But overall, man, I mean, I I don't know too many other people who are doing this in midday. Um, you know, you know, there. But I think this is important because what I try to do here on this page is build black men up, and I think it's important for black men. A key component to that is masculinity. You know, and if mm -hmm. all we have is little Nas X, that that you know, to, to, that's not gonna work. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. we have to begin to draw from our ancestors, uh, and it's important that we know what they look like because if they look like us, then that that gives us a, an image to look at. You know, that gives exactly. us somebody to, to pay attention to. You know, to pattern ourselves after. Somebody that looks like you. Here's another photograph, if I can uh, get this one up, if I can. We'll see. It's kind of small. I'll, uh, oh, man. This is a, another palace guard here. So this is what this European man was doing. Uh, around the Middle East. He saw this. This is another. He went down there. And th th these are the images that he saw. Uh -huh. You see what I mean? This is in Egypt, by the way, at the time. This, he said he went to Egypt three times. This is what he saw in Egypt. These are the people he saw in Egypt. These men. You know, from the prince to the palace guard. These are jet black black men. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, either way, you guys, if you appreciate what I'm doing, make sure you contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. I don't want to run any more commercials. But you know but, what you're showing, brother? Go ahead. You said it. You're showing images of masculinity. Mm -hmm. You know, you're showing images of strength. Also, you're, you're teaching us and you're telling stories of men fighting, men not just fighting for fighting's sake and just to roam and pillage and plunder. These are men fighting for a reason. You know, you were talking about uh, Abu Bakari the first, he was going to do what Allah told him to do. He's doing God's work. And he was focused on what he had to focus. And a lot of people, and even a lot of feminists and womanists might say, see, but they're having war back then. And then. Let me tell you something, that's something that men do. Mm -hmm. You can't stop that. This is what men do. And it's just showing men in strong, masculine, pivotal roles. This, these pictures of just 
men in just beautiful roles, showing beautiful black men. You know, right, images we rarely see. Yeah. They always show, when they talk about black history, they always show you slave ships. They don't ever show you what we were doing before that. You see? Mm -hmm. they don't, and that's just a small percentage of people who were caught uh, and captured out of a large group. Yeah, it was a significant amount, but the bottom line is this is what our people were doing. Look at these black men. Look at the face of this black man right here. Just look at that face. I know some people that look just like that dude. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But um, so either way, man, I appreciate you guys, man. We'll be back a little later on to talk some more. Uh, thank you, Malika. If you guys appreciate what thank I'm you. doing, make sure you contribute to the Super Chat, the Cash App, and the PayPal. Shout out to Black Gator. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Kalanjila. Uh, let me see. Kalon G. Kala. Kalon G. Kala. Thank you for this history series. We'd rather study, study urban drama than our legacy ride. Uh, let me see. Broke Genius. They were castle builders who, who was trying to build a castle today. Uh, let me see what else. Black Broke Genius said this is important because history led to the transatlantic slave trade. God fearing king. Thank you, my dudes. Thank you, more blessings come salute. John Guillory. Uh, thanks, Dennis. Loving these lessons, brother. No problem. Uh, let me see who else we got in here. Um, Deacon Dave, Super Sticker, and then Roscoe Lee Brown. Nothing on the cash app today. I guess they light on the cash app today. But I'll put it up here. If you guys appreciate what I'm doing, make sure you contribute to the Super Chat, the cash app, and the PayPal. But other than that, man, we'll catch you guys, uh, catch y'all a little bit later on. This is Dennis Sperling with my friend Malika. Thank you so much, you guys. And uh, I'm out.